Okay, building high available ELK stack for Drupal. Let me introduce myself. I'm Margie. I'm a system engineer at Morph, which is a small Drupal agency based in Sydney, Australia. Being small is a good thing, but we are lucky enough to have a few enterprise clients from pharmaceutical, finance sector, media sector. So that gave me the opportunity to do some cool systems stuff, DevOps stuff. And I hope to show you part of it. I realized that this is a really difficult topic to present on. Like when I was presenting in DrupalCon uh, New Orleans, that was for beginners, it was more about playing with the data and putting your Alex stack together using Docker with a little bit of live demo. That was playful, but this stuff actually talking about the high available solution, I found it very dry topic and it's like not too many opportunities to laugh. So if you find any, please do. <laughs> I need a little bit of encouragement to make it interesting. So this is targeting uh, sysadmins mostly and technical savvy developers. Uh, and I will present a high available elastic search, uh, elastic cluster solution um, and it will be AWS oriented. And it's for intermediate audience. So I expect you to know a little bit about the Elk stack. You have installed it, you have touched it, you know what it is about and you are interested into how to make it high available. So I'll go through a few topics. First, I will present a potential uh, design which is scalable enterprise high available. I will talk a little bit about how to auto scale different components of the solution, how to uh, prevent the stack running out of space, how to secure some of the data flow in it and how to patch your stack without having any downtown because that is a high available requirement. And being at DrupalCon, I will also cover a few ways of getting uh, Drupal logs into Logstash. So what's this ELK again? This, uh, this is the, how my slide at Drupal Conola started. Uh, the ELK R3 open source program. Elasticsearch Logstash Kibana. This is from the Elastic, the company uh, which is behind these products. Uh, when they introduced another component in the stack called Beats, they were trying to come up with a representation of Elk and B together. So this is Belk. <laughs> it was more fun, but I really liked it. So some people call the Elk stack, call it Belk stack because of the Beats being there as well. Beats, Elasticsearch, Elasticsearch, Kibana. But the official name is Elastic stack, especially now with version five, <coughs> I think got beta last week, five days ago. So this is the official name of the stack of the technology I'm talking about. So what's the goal? Just quickly, I know you know this, like just maybe just to refresh. So we want to take, be able to take data from any source in any format, transform it, process it, enrich it, uh, and store it so you can search and analyze and visualize it. So that's the goal of the stack. And as I said, it has four components. Elasticsearch, that's where we store the data. Uh, it's distributed high available. Um, and I just want to say there are plugins you can install in it to enhance its uh, functionality. I'm just saying it here because uh, I will cover a few plugins as well. <coughs> you could spend all day talking about Elasticsearch. It's a really big topic. Logstash is the tool which collects, process, and um, enriches the data, that's, that's your transformation pipeline. Uh, it has many inputs, many outputs, and uh, it can do stuff in between. So this picture kind of describes what you can do. You can get data from file, from socket, from database, then you transform it, enrich it, and then you store it somewhere. <coughs> we will use mainly the Elasticsearch storage. As I said, there are inputs, we will focus on beats. There are outputs, outputs, plugins, we will focus on Elasticsearch. And there are ways of manipulating the data in the process. <laughs> and then you look at it via Kibana, which is open source data visualization platform. It's a, you use your browser to interact with your data and which, which you search basically 
from the Elasticsearch where it's stored. And Beats, the latest addition to this family, that these are like open source, like a lightweight data shippers written in Go. So that's Elastic's effort to, you know, like find a really lightweight way of shipping the data from the source to either Logstash or straight to the Elasticsearch. So say you install a little file beat on your Apache log and it reads your Apache log and, and streams it to Logstash or Elasticsearch. Um, also popular, it's top beat which, which run metrics and streams it to Logstash or Elasticsearch so you get some kind of metrics for free I will show you. <coughs> so. I talked about these four components. This is just to, so you know how, how, how they talk to each other. So in Elasticsearch, I have the data. Kibana connects to Elasticsearch and vi visualizes the data, right? Like, but but uh, the raw data somehow needs to get there. So you stream them, stream it to Logstash, and you can do it from either bit. You can see that one of the source has bit, so maybe there is an, a file bit installed which, which does that, or maybe that's the source itself, like maybe syslog streaming it via TCP. It can be the application itself, you know, like opening a socket uh, and, and sending it to Logstash. <coughs> or, as I said, uh, that's what Elastic tries to do. Maybe the bead is capable of streaming the, da the data straight into Elasticsearch bypassing Logstash, so ha you have one less component, <coughs> it's easier. This is just to represent what Logstash does in between. So this is an example of source. This is a log file on a Apache server. And this is when it goes through the pipeline, I look at it and I can see this pie chart with a response code. So that's what that gives me. So that was just like a quick, quick walk, walk through, through the four components, but I really wanna focus on how to build that in AWS and how to make it high available. I thought it would be good to have a use case. So imagine that you have a client, enterprise client, maybe from the banking sector. They have a few dozens of sites and servers and they want to have all their logs in one place. They cannot lose any log. They might have data retention policies, you know, like they might be, they need to be able to produce, produce audits and maybe response to customer complaints. And I think that um, the Elk stack is a potential solution for that requirement and maybe we are lucky enough that the customer uh, approved AWS as environment they can deploy that into rather than doing it um, on like bare metal in-house. So I will <coughs> cover that. So this is basically the stack, but how can we make it high available? Well, we modify it a little bit. You can see we still have the same components, but what happened there is that in the middle suddenly I have a message queue. I have a message queue and the log stash, there are more log stash instances than before. So you have data coming from different sources, maybe via beats, maybe directly from syslog or application, not to log stash directly, but to a load balancer. <coughs> then I have more than one log stash shipper behind the load balancer uh, to make that part high available. And the shipper has the only one purpose, store that event, the lock line into a message queue. So that part must be available, it must not go down, I don't wanna lose any single line there. So that must be up and running all the time. And then there is the other part on the right side, which, actually skip it, so this, this was the first part which stores it in the message queue. And this is the other part, when you have log stash indexers, the, these indexes, that's basically the data processing and reaching manipulation. They just like fetch it from the message queue and you can have one too many. You auto scale, you basically, if your queue is growing, you provision more of these. If, if your queue is empty, you can destroy some of them and you store it in Elasticsearch, but here we can see that we have a, a cluster uh, with three nodes at least and Kibana reads from that Elasticsearch cluster. So let's di dive in into some of the components and, and uh, explain why I would do it this way. So the shipping data part, we have either via beats or via the application or the server itself going in load balancer 
So I would recommend using Beats. File Beat is really robust. Um, it's an before it was called Logstash Forwarder. It's really nicely written application which basically reads a log file and line by line transmits it to either Logstash or Elasticsearch. Um, the beauty is that if it had any connection troubles, it would wait and try again. So you would never, if, if it's not down for like one day and your log file rotates more than once, you, wouldn't, you would not lose any data. Syslog can do that as well, uh, but Syslog has just you know, output bu buffer and if it cannot reach the target for any reason for a while, it starts dropping, dropping data. So that's why I would rather say use, use beats in between rather than streaming from Syslog stri uh, straight. Application can stream as well as I said. We can do socket, web socket, TCP. Don't use UDP of course, you know, we can lose packets or they can go uh, arrive in a different order. And if you can, of course, put SSL encryption on, on that TCP connection. So now I'm looking at the load balancer being in front of two Logstash shippers. So let's, what's the Logstash shipper? I suddenly started saying Logstash shipper without explaining what it is. So the main purpose of the Logstash shipper, it's a Logstash and Logstash, as we said, can take data from any source and uh, many sources and write it to different many sources. So shipper here is just that ships data from the source to a message queue. So it's really configured in light way. I don't do any heavy processing and a regular expression matching. I just want this to go through as a pipe. So the only purpose of the shipper is there to be able to store it in the message queue in the format the message queue understands. And I put the load balancer in front of it, well, of course, to make it high available so I can take any, if there is at least one up and running, I can take the others, if they can fail, I can update them, I can reboot them, I can reprovision them, I'm not losing any data. I also discovered that there is a, a, a nice ELB supports CPU auto scaling when you use it for SSL offloading. So originally I was experimenting in, like Loxa Shipper can be configured to do SSL offload termination for you, right? But that takes a lot of CPU and it's really hard to scale because if you have like a sudden spike in data, if you wanna be a pipe and it's sudden like CPU requirements, you, you don't have enough time to auto scale. But if you, if you put that SSL termination in front of that, a load balancer happily auto scales for you. So it's a beautiful, beautiful way of, of using that fact. Also, uh, by using Elastic Load Balancer, you protect yourself from a zone failure. I mean like you have three shippers maybe and one zone goes down, you still have two zones up, like you don't lose any data. There are some disadvantages of using Elastic Load Balancer. <laughs> Elastic Load Balancer does not give you a static IP address. Some enterprises wanna have, give me the IP address and port so I can open my firewall. Well, you cannot with this. Uh, I tried to over uh, work around about that by putting like a HA proxy in front of it with uh, e EIP Elastic uh, IP, but then you once again you have the problem of making the HA proxy uh, available itself, and you know like how do f how do you flow the IP address between the, these two instances? You make it too complicated. So ideally you don't do that. Uh, you don't need that. Ideally you don't need a static IP address. And also ELB does not support client side as self authentication. So uh, Logstash shipper does. So you might say well only clients with the certificates I trust can connect to me, otherwise I basically don't establish the, the connection. With ELB, any client with SSL can connect to you. But you can overcome that once again, you know what kind of data you expect, maybe you have some kind of signature or you know that the field must have you know this value, if it does not, you drop it straight away, it's like a lightweight operation. Behind the shippers we have message queue. Uh, that's where all the logs ends up. I selected SQS because it's fast, reliable, scalable, and f fully managed message queue. It's surprisingly cheap in the AWS uh, space. And it, it, it does unlimited number of services and messages. Uh, I remember once being outside, like uh, during the weekend, somewhere in a forest, got a message that uh, I'm, not getting, uh, I'm not getting data in, in Elasticsearch. And when I got back, 
I didn't really rush. But when I got back, I, I found two and a half million messages waiting in, <laughs> in the message queue uh, because the logstash indexer went down. I had like the auto scaling didn't work properly. And the funny thing is that when I fixed that, the, the queue got provisioned within a couple of hours and the client didn't re e even realize because they haven't lost any data. <coughs> there is one disadvantage of using SQS. Uh, the SQS protocol is not supported by Beats. I'm saying that only because Redis is supported by Beats. So if I use Redis instead of SQS, I could potentially configure my Beats to, to stream straight to the Redis queue and I would maybe I would make it high available and I would be able to avoid the logs that sh shippers in front of it. So I'm just pointing it out so, so you don't find out too late. Redis is still very popular for, for, for using in this deployment. So the indexer. So the indexer is just like a standalone box which just like fetches the logs, the lines from message queue and processes it and stores it in Elasticsearch. Um, High availability in this context means that if it's not working, it means that you are like a high availability means that you processing you are processing logs close to real time. That's what, in my opinion, the high availability in this case because it's just fetch process store fetch process pros. So um, if you can see that uh, this is nice if you use auto scaling policy here, you can either monitor the amount of messages in the SQS queue. And if it keeps growing, you provision another uh, logstash instance to help and then terminate it. Or maybe you can monitor the CPU of, of the logstash instances and if it's like close to 100 person for a period of time, you provision more. And then Elasticsearch. So Elasticsearch, as I said, is it, it's designed to be high available. It, it's scalable by, by design. Uh, I've seen people using two nodes. Makes absolutely no sense. So you need at least three nodes because when you use two nodes, you either have no high availability or you can get split brain. Like surprisingly, many people don't uh, realize that. So you want to use at least three master eligible nodes. That's the minimum to, to have a high available. Eligible master eligible means that the the node can become master. There's some kind of election going on and and based on quorum and. Uh, each node can be either master or data, storing data, or both, or client. Client means that it cannot become master, it cannot store any data, but it can talk to any other nodes, so it's kind of like a smart load balancer. So master eligible means, like, if you're starting, I would recommend just using three nodes and, and uh, configure them to, to be master and data nodes as well and it's a good start. And only when you need to grow the size of the cluster, then I would go into three dedicated masters, meaning that they will have no data at all, and all the remaining nodes would be data nodes. There is no need to put uh, Elastic Load Balancer in front of the Elastic Search cluster, and that's because the load balancing is built in. As I said, uh, once again, I have seen how to switch, basically recommend like take load balancer, put one, two, three elastic search nodes behind it, and this is how you talk to your cluster. There is no point in doing this, in my opinion. You just get an extra moving part for no reason with need for a life check, health check. Um, no need because Logstash supports multiple hosts in its output, so it, when it's streaming data to the elastic search, cluster, you can say this, this, this node, and it just rounds Robin, sending it there. And also Kibana recommends something else, talking to the Elasticsearch cluster rather than a uh, load balancer. I will cover that a little bit later. Each Elasticsearch node, which stores data, uh, has a configuration which says this is the directory or directories when the data is stored. I recommend using SSD instores instance store for that if uh, if that's good big enough for you. So EC2 instances, some of them come with local SSD drive, which is connected to them, and maybe they can be reasonably big. So if this is 
good size for you, use that. That's the fastest ever uh, elastic search cluster you can get. <coughs> Only if, uh, and this instance store, of course, is not um, persistent. So if you power off that instance, you lose it. But why would you do that? Well, if you reboot it, 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 it is persistent. And <coughs> because Elasticsearch uh, by default has always every single data as like in, like it has one replica. So if you lose one node completely, you always have the data somewhere else. And when you reprovision the node, it will once again um, create the replica. So you basically, if you don't power off more than one <laughs> node at a time, you don't lose any data, even though you store your data on the non-permanent instance store. If that is not big enough for you, uh, you have to use, uh, I would recommend using the Elastic Block Store. Um, the SS SSD is a standard these days. I found out that like, if you need a small one, I would go for the provisioned IOPS, which dedicates, which guarantees you that you get this amount of speed, this amount of IO per second on that. But if you use the general purpose SSD, the bigger it is, the more IOPS you get. So you might find out that if you are using the maximum size of general purpose SSD, you get the same IOPS and speed as if you were paying for the provisioned one. Like that, that's good to know. But I think it recently changed and the provisioned IOPS actually has twice as many IOPS or twice as many speed as the maximum size general purpose one. But when I was looking at it like a few months ago, it was exactly the same parameters if you, if you max it out. That was very interesting to look at. <coughs> I would avoid making these uh, nodes too full. Uh, basically, when, when it, it's becoming too full, it becomes more chatty. There is something which is like a watermark at 85%. If a node gets to 85% storage full, it stops writing data and tries to <coughs> send it to some other node and like maybe you don't have space there. It's better never get there. Basically have alerts, have like a, don't let this happen. So when you have this cluster, you kind of need to decide how much data you want to store. Like a, Maybe you are happy to have only the last two weeks of all your traffic or the last four weeks. You basically need to decide what's the, how many days you wanna store. And what you don't need to store, you can create a snapshot of. So there is the snapshot and restore module, which is built in Elasticsearch, and that allows you to create snapshots in a remote repository. And so it uh, supports several backends. Uh, and in my opinion, if you install the AWS Cloud plugin, you have the ability to create S3 backup. So you basically say whatever is like, you, you create backup maybe every day, snapshot every day, and then delete everything older than 30 days. And you know that if somebody needed to go and search the logs from last month, Monday, you just restore from the snapshot. There is a really nice tool designed for that called Curator. Uh, which is the perfect tool for creating and deleting snapshots and operating on Elasticsearch. I highly recommend using that one for maintaining the space. Uh, I have curator running basically saying delete everything on that index which would take more than 800 gigabyte. So I don't limit it to number of days because you might get a surprise spike in data can fill your disk, but I limit it based on space. So I know like, yes, what can happen that suddenly instead of having three months of data, maybe I have only two because there was spike I didn't expect, but I will never get in a situation when, when my cluster gets full. Okay, as I said, you can talk about Elasticsearch all day long and I'm definitely not the guy who is, who has the knowledge to talk about Elasticsearch all day long, but I've, I covered the don't and do, in my opinion, I, I learned with this deployment. And Kibana, I have to admit I have run in Kibana as a single instance and it never died on me, but I'm ready to reprovision it very quickly by running a simple script, script which would just provision a new one. If you have many heavy Kibana users, just put a load balancer in a few Kibanas and maybe you would auto scale them. When you have Kibana, you, you think, how do I connect it to the cluster? Because you kinda, you either, my first thought was, okay, I use the load balancer in front of the cluster, that's the not recommended configuration. Then I'm thinking somehow it would be nice if it 
talked locally to the to a Elasticsearch node, and they actually say, you know what, provision a new Elasticsearch instance on the same box your Kibana is, and configure it to be client, the client node. So it that cannot become master, it cannot <laughs> store any data, but it's the smart load balancer which can see the all other uh, members of the cluster and, and routes your, like Kibana requests smartly. Ah, progress check. When I was reading about how to, how to present to a technical audience, they say, make a joke. And I could not figure out uh, what kind of joke I can make related to Elasticsearch and Elk cluster. But I have a colleague who have been to many DevOps sessions today, and he said that there were some people sleeping and leaving. So I think if it happens to me, I won't feel bad. <laughs> so that's my joke. Okay, so we have uh, looked at a pos possible design I consider reasonable of scalable and high available ELK stack. I talked a little bit about auto scaling its components. Um, I talked about how important is it to prevent Elasticsearch from running out of disk space. We touched a little bit of like SSL floating ELB tricks. And there are still two two topics I wanna talk about. How, how would you upgrade such a stack? Once again, it's supposed to be scalable, it's supposed to be high available, running all the time. And being at DrupalCon, we need to talk about how to get Drupal logs too. So, how would we patch this? So, look at the logs to shippers. Well, we know it is high available already. Well, we just provision another log stash shipper instance connected to the load balancer and after it becomes part of the cluster, then we deregister the old instance running the older version. Instead of shutting it down, I would deregister it because there is a thing on a load balancer, elastic load balancer called connection draining, which is enabled by default. And it's basically when you um, deregister an instance and there is a TCP connection established, it's just the register itself from the load balancer, so it does not get any new connections, but it does not terminate the already established TCP connection. So it's a nice to have, you know, if you are killing an old instance, just the register it from the uh, load balancer first, and you know, there is a setting how many minutes, and hopefully most of the connections will uh, gracefully finish. So it's a nice way of doing it. But if you have, uh, um, auto scaling policy, this, I believe this will be done for you. Indexers, as we said, if you take an logstash indexer, that's the thing which keeps taking data from the queue and processing it. If you take that offline for a little while, you are not losing any data. You just are not getting close to real time data after Elasticsearch. They are growing in the queue, but uh, so that's one way of doing it. On, uh, you can provision a new one. And once again, you can have like auto scale policy saying, I always want to have one member in the cluster and then you just kill that one and a new one gets provisioned. When you're patching Elasticsearch uh, cluster, there are two ways of, uh, of doing it. Usually when you go from minor to minor version, so 2.2 to 2.3, you can do something which is called rolling upgrade. So you take one node offline, you Create it, you install the higher version of the Elasticsearch software, and then you bring it online again. You wait for the cluster to rejoin, to be happy, to become healthy, and then do another one. That's why it's called rolling upgrade. So there is absolutely no downtown. You still can write into it. You can still search from it. Like you cannot see anything, maybe some performance degradation, but there is no, no outage at all. Opposite to that is full cluster restart. You have to do it usually when you go from one to two or maybe like five is going to be released very soon. I'm pretty sure that you, you will have to do full cluster restart. And uh, I got burned by that. If you um, upgrading version of the Elasticsearch program, you have to reinstall your plugins. They are, uh, they are version minor version specific. 
And there is one thing I realized you can do as well. If you don't know Elasticsearch that well, which is my case, and I know that I will want to roll out version 5, but I have, you know, like, say, maybe I have one, one terabyte of data in the cluster, and I am honestly scared to just, you know, do a, a upgrade. How about I do live migration when I provision a brand new Elasticsearch cluster running version 5, so I have two. I have the old one, I have the new one. Then I configure my Logstash indexers to stream to both Elasticsearch is the new one and the old one because they support many outputs. Nothing is stopping me from streaming the data to the old and new one. Then I, I provision a Kibana server on my Docker, local Docker, just to look whether I'm getting the same data, whether there's any trouble. No trouble. I restore from snapshot the data I have because I do daily snapshots. So I just, in the new cluster, I just run curator and restore from snapshot the last how many days I want to keep. I verify by Akibana that all data, all visualization, everything works as it is. And then I just like flip Kibana for the users, to the, the production Kibana to the new cluster. I can just like keep, keep streaming to both for some time, no complaints, and only after I'm sure a few days later I just deprovision the, the you know, I stop streaming to the old cluster and deprovision it. I, I'm not sure whether it's called live migration. I call it live migration, but I have done this and I realize how powerful it is when you are not sure, you can always go back. And as I said, patching Kibana is super easy. You just provision a new version, either take over its Elastic IP if you use it or change the DNS record. If you use Route 53, you can do this automatically and then kill the old one. Well, good. So I think I got through the boring stuff. Now maybe something a little bit more interesting, cost estimate. Uh, I thought you might be interested uh, don't get scared. Just before I will show you the numbers, please, my, my numbers currently are something like that. I think I, let's say that I store about 500 gigabyte a month and I wanna, of data in my cluster and I wanna keep it for three months. So it's already 1.5 terabyte of data. And it gives me something about close to 200 events per second coming in. So that, of course, cost me CPU, cost me memory. Like, so if I look, and so, so that, let, let's look at the solution. So this is the minimum number of components I can do. Two shippers to be high available. One Logstash indexer, maybe it can, so there's already three EC2 instances. Minimum three nodes for Elasticsearch, that's six, and one Kibana. So I cannot go under seven instances, whatever I do. So this is, this is the rough estimate of the cost per month in USD dollars. So as, yeah, as you can see, I'm using C4 large. These are big instances, that's why it costs so much. But uh, I'm getting to like three times index, uh, three times Logstash, three times Elasticsearch. That one is, they have 16 gigabyte of memory that, that, that really like memory. They, they like memory a lot. And you see Kibana doesn't take anything. It's on T2 small, very happy. And then we have uh, three one terabyte EBS volumes. They are also pricey. So that's the gator makes. And the SQS load balancer S3 traffic that doesn't do anything. Like, so in total it's 1200 a month roughly. So it would be close to 1000 euro a month. And I can probably buy, if I had much less data, and, but still wanted to keep it high available. So I cannot change the number of instances, uh, but I probably don't have the SSD EBS. I would have like um, just the local SSD drive. I think I can go to half, maybe one third. That means 400 USD, but not, not below. So this is the starting price of the solution in my opinion. There are alternatives. <coughs> Elastic, the company behind this uh, offers Elastic Cloud, which is hosted Elastic Search and Kibana on AWS. But note that there is no Logstash. That's why they have they have they, they host it as a, as a software as a service, uh, and it starts at forty five dollars per month, and it is high available. It gives you you know like your Elasticsearch and Kibana and like some security as well. There is no Logstash, and that's why I believe that their shippers are being designed in a way so they can stream straight to Elasticsearch because if they don't host the Logstash, there is no way how to do that easily, you know, they try to figure out how we can get the data straight to the elastic search, having the logic already on the shippers when the data source is, then we can avoid Logstash completely. 
and people are still happy and we get our money. So really nice and smart. And there are these platforms also like a Logly, Symologic, many others I don't have experience with. And they also start at something small. At least I check two of them, like maybe you can start 50 or 80 a month. But when you start playing with how many dice I wanna keep and how much data I have, if I put the bars to the similar numbers I keep in my cluster, I was also getting to something similar about like 1,000, 1,200. So of course, they, by, by having, they have condensed infrastructure, they can, they can be more competitive. You please do not forget that by doing this in-house, your time is an extra cost. It's not something you walk away from. You know? So you have to consider that when you are thinking whether you wanna do it yourself or do it somewhere else. A few compliments. Monitoring, I think it's like a must have. You cannot run this without monitoring. Uh, Elastic search needs to be monitored for cluster health. It's like a high level monitoring. It's either green, yellow, red. Green means everything is fine. Yellow means something is missing, a, a node is rebooting or missed. You haven't lost any data. Uh, it, everything still works fine, but you have no high availability. And red is there is a problem, data inconsistency you cannot write. Or, so you need to, you need to definitely monitor that. I would alert at least at these few things, like the status of the cluster, I would alert on disk usage and inode usage. I would also alert on Kibana availability, especially when you have management looking at it. Uh, and if you know that you are getting a hundred of events per second, for example, it's very likely that if you look at the most recent record in your cluster, it won't be older than five minutes. So it's a good test to, to run, you know, like every now and then, like what is the, the, the youngest entry in my cluster? And if it's too old, I can see that the data is not coming through. There is also something which is called Logstash Heartbeat. As I have one Logstash shipper here and Logstash indexer here, like Logstash has a heartbeat output plugin which just injects a message. So that's in front of the queue and that the other one processes it and realizes it's the heartbeat and so you can, you can uh, monitor that as well. Actually, I do have that in place. And you need metrics for figure out what kind of instance, how much memory, so CPU load, swap, all this. And Elasticsearch is like a, a lot of, like Elastic, the company behind this, has really good uh, documentation, I have to say. And there are like pages of what you can monitor and like the bigger your cluster gets, the more you monitor, need to monitor and understand what's going there, there. JVM performance, uh, all of this. This is just to show you what you can get for free. This is a uh, matrix which you get when you use the uh, file, a top beat, top beat, uh, beat. Uh, so here you can see that I, I'm comparing two Logstash shippers and one Logstash indexers. So the shippers being behind the load balancer, you see that the CPU, the, the load is copies each other. And even the indexer is like somewhere else. You can still see that it still relies on the amount of data flowing through that solution. It's nice to see. But please realize that you need to, ha if you wanna use this, you need another little elk somewhere else. You don't stream the metrics data to the same cluster you wanna monitor because if it becomes broken, you have no data to look at, of course. <laughs> it's very tempting <laughs> and you get, they try to use Kibana and give you these nice visualizations. Some of them make sense to sysadmin, some of them don't, but it, this is available and it costs close to zero time to, to put together. There are like a few web, there are a few Elastic Search plugins, web, web admin plugins. Most popular, one of the most popular is Kopf. It gives you this overview. I can see that my cluster is red. I can see the data distributions, if it was relocating or like I would see what's happening there. You can see that I have three nodes. I can see ES32 in the middle is the master currently. Heap usage is a 52, disk usage is, you know, like, 50%, I have 1.5 terabyte data in the cluster and two billion documents. Uh, so that's something you put on the dashboard. Elastic headquarter, similar statistic. You can see that, like how much a top beat index cost you per day, 2.3 data. To put, of course it's irrelevant, depends how many nodes you have, but you can see what it costs you on space. Oh, 
good. So I think we are getting there. <laughs> Drupal watchdog clocks. How do we get them in Drupal? How do we ship them to Drupal? There is this Drupal DB log input filter in Logstash. Don't use it because, <laughs> as you can see from the syntax, it tries to connect straight to the database and fetch the lines from the database. So that's something which should not be even be possible in production situation, and you should not have DB log enabled anyway, right? So just to, so what I recommend is uh, syslog, uh, enable the syslog module, make it stream to the servers, R syslog or ng syslog, ng log. I would configure the R syslog to, uh, to create a dedicated file. Like here you can see I, I, I'm creating like var log Drupal log. So that gives me, of course I could use this default syslog and then you know like if all the syslog goes to log stage I then parse it. But why would I use like a CPU power to, to distinguish between, oh this is Drupal, this is PHP. If I have the luxury of streaming it from a file and, and tag it saying, this is Drupal. So when I get it already in Logstash, I already have the tag, I already know that this is Drupal. It doesn't cost me any CPU to, to, to find out. And also, if I actually use file beat on that file, rather than configuring the syslog to stream directly, I, as I mentioned before, I have, it's more reliable because file beat is designed to wait if the cluster, if the connectivity is bad for some kind of reason while the RCS log logging remotely via TCP will drop the database. I just prepared uh, how I would parse watchdog log in Logstash, so uh, this is a little bit of out of scope, but you can see that you get a line from Drupal, right? And this is, you create a pattern, which I call watchdog, uh, and then, so this is the pattern, and the bottom line is actually the stream. So we can see the host name would get matched to in a variable called Drupal V host. The timestamp would end up in Drupal timestamp. The 127 would end up in this Drupal IP. Um, I put it in a gist, <laughs> if you want to have a look. And so, and then I define syslog watchdog just by using the watchdog pattern and putting the timestamp in front of it. And this is how you put it in the logstash indexer configuration, and basically trying to match it against the regular expression pattern. There is also a module called logs HTTP that streams JSON event from Dr Drupal watchdog straight to a endpoint via TCP, and you would use that one uh, when you are not in charge of the syslog on the server when somebody hosts it for you. I know that Acquia also has this uh, log beat, a log gem. Log gem, like they have this live streaming through the GUI, but there is also a log gem which you can get, and it connects to like a web socket, uh, so you, you can you can get the real time close to real time stream of uh, logs from your potential Acquia subscription to a file somewhere and then get it to your log stash. So I think I have covered, hopefully, I have covered most of the topics I wanted to tell you about. And I did it in reasonable time. Nobody's sleeping. So to wrap up, I think building your own high available High available elk is a joy. The joy does not finish with its deployment. It's a continuous joy, in my opinion. And monitor is a must have. So I prepared like a few links if you want to know where to start next. There are a few official uh, code. There is uh, Ansible, Elasticsearch, Puppet, Elasticsearch, Cookbooks. That's by Elastic. So these are official Cookbooks modules roles. Simple Kibana role just to show you how in Ansible how you can do it quickly. File beat as well, the Drupal watchdog gist. And as I said, the ELK stack, the Elastic documentation is brilliant. If you just read it, if you want to understand it, it's just brilliant. And there are a few references to my previous presentation and uh, that's it. 
Any questions? So I have two questions. The bits that you were showing, the file bits to deliver to the log stash, can you configure them to that they deliver uh, chunks of information so that it's not every line that is registered by the Apache, but like use them as a buffer to have like five mega and then you make one transaction. And the second part of the question is, does it work over HTTP, HTTPS connection? We, don't we have a proxy actually issue and we don't want to ship every line through the proxy. So our idea was if we can pack them in a chunk of five mega or 10 mega and then ship them through the proxy so that we have one connection and we probably not get fired by the other team that is managing the proxy. Okay, I understand the question. I am not sure, I think you can define the chunks, but if you cannot, I would probably I would have a log rotating policy which would create me chunks in a size. Because you can, when, when you stream from a uh, file beat, you can use regular expression as well. So it, that keeps matching all the names. So maybe you can have a log rotate policy that you create like a new five gigabyte big and give it this name and then the file beat realizes, oh, there is a new file and streams it at once. But uh, that would be my way of getting over the first requirement you had. And where it supports HTTP as instead of um, TCP, that part I don't know. But I would check the documentation because as I was checking, it supports uh, um, TCP with SSL, it supports Redis, it supports Elasticsearch. So it's possible that they will keep adding, you know, like as I said, they try to avoid using Logstash to be able to stream directly. So it's likely that, that the beat might support uh, HTTP as well. Can I ask you as well, you said that uh, you can actually get rid of the first load balancer and the log stash if you use Redis directly. Why don't you do that? Because Why do you complicate your... Understand the question, so uh, let's go back. Where is the cluster? Honestly, when I found out that there is this SQS and it gives me this unlimited storage and it's cheap, I thought that it's better for my case than using um, Redis, which I would have to make high available. I, I think AWS probably supports high available Redis, but the auto scaling is not there. Like I, I cannot be sure it can cope with, with um, yeah. I, I thought that actually using the queue was, was was uh, easier, honestly, and didn't cost that much. Plus, I like yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, that's the answer. Okay, guys. Oh, one more. Uh, just a minor question regarding uh, your slides. I didn't get something. Uh, the first one is that you said that Kibana recommends running on a local. Uh, ES node, but on another slide, you said that don't run Kibana on existing ES node, master node. Mm -hmm. master I'm confused. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that depends what kind of node it is. I say do not run, Kib if you have your Elastic Search cluster, which consists on masters and data nodes, don't connect Kibana to any of these. If you, you want to connect Kibana to a Elastic Search node, but a different one, which you configure not to be master, you configure it not to be data, so it becomes so-called client node. And that still talks to all the other nodes, but... It will also produce it, a user it, Yeah, yeah it, Kibana talks to it because you install it on the same server as Kibana is, but there is no data, no logic, it's just like a load balancing to the, to the other nodes. So th that's the recommended solution. Yes, so it, no, no master and no data. Just just like, a, it's basically like a load balancer, internal load balancer within the Elasticsearch cluster. Yeah. 
Another question that uh, I don't know it's uh, in scope of this uh, presentation. Uh, do you have any way to uh, query Elasticsearch via JSON or REST services in general uh, in order to retrieve data that has been indexed? Because uh, from what I see, Elasticsearch has a magic to combine data from several, several sources, uh, be it uh, an Apache server or uh, MySQL or PostgreSQL or whatever uh, system that you have. So all data are, are uh, already indexed on the Elasticsearch. Can you use these indexed data uh, somehow to, uh, with an API to you know, present it, I don't know, on a Drupal site or something like that? So. Okay. As I said, I don't understand Elasticsearch that much, but I know once again, you can use Logstash and use the Elasticsearch input plugin. So you can basically have your Logstash hooking into Elasticsearch and read already existing data through that and deliver it somewhere else. That, that's one, one way of getting that. Also, Kibana shows you what, what, what the data is indexed and what data is not. If you browse a index, which um, uh, if you browse index which haven't been re-indexed, it tells you and, and the GUI guides you to do so. But I don't know more about that, unfortunately. But Logstash has the option not, of the, not only to feed Elasticsearch, but also to read from Elasticsearch? Yes. Okay, <laughs> okay guys. Thank you.